Yemen, a country on the southeastern edge of the Arabian Peninsula that has been racked by civil war since 2014, which many now describe as the world's worst humanitarian crisis. As in other countries across the Arab world, though, the last decade did not begin with war, but with the Yemeni people taking to the streets to demand economic and political freedoms. I'm Kelly McFarland, Director of Programs and Research at ISD. During this period, I was an Arabian Peninsula analyst in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research at the State Department, analyzing events as they unfolded from Washington. And I'm Alastair Somerville, editor at the Institute and producer of this podcast. This mini-series, Diplomacy in the Arab Spring at 10, brings together young scholars and thinkers and U.S. ambassadors to try to reflect on events in the Arab world 10 years on. If you haven't already had a chance to, we recommend taking a listen to the first two episodes in the series, which explore the revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt. To understand the 2011 uprisings in Yemen and to discuss the story of the country since then, we brought together Ambassador Jerry Firestein I'm Jerry Firestein. I am currently the Senior Vice President at the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C. From 2010 until 2013, I was the U.S. Ambassador to Yemen. Uh, And then uh, afterwards, from 2013 to 2016, I was the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs uh, in in the State Department. Uh, and uh, did, as part of those responsibilities, also engage in some of the oversight on Yemen. And Ibrahim Jalal. I am Ibrahim Jalal, a Yemeni researcher. I am a non-resident scholar at the Gulf and Yemen program at the Middle East Institute. I'm also a consultant on uh, conflict, defense, and, and peace affairs generally. Back then, when Ambassador Jay was uh, an ambassador to Yemen. I was finalizing my last year of high school. So in fact, I was in the midst of events, just observing as one of those young people, you know, trying to, to see what's going to happen. And, and you have all these uh, political narratives coming through. Uh, onwards, I, I traveled to pursue my studies overseas in Southeast Asia and in Europe and finished my studies in in, in conflict studies. Uh, and since then I've been doing research and consultancy, mainly focused on Yemen. We'll also hear insights from two other scholar practitioners who we also heard in previous episodes. Tamara kaufman Widdis from the Brookings Institution who was serving at the State Department during the Arab uprisings, and Rita Stefan a scholar at North Carolina State University and also a regional coordinator for religious and ethnic minorities in the Middle East Bureau at the U.S. Agency for International Development. She is the co-editor of a new book on the region, Women Rising, in and beyond the Arab Spring. As the revolution broke out in Yemen, where did things stand across the region? Here's Tamara kaufman Wittes to bring us up to speed. Once the Egyptian uprising began, then it really started to feel like a a dam had broken. 18 days of Egyptian revolution ended on February 11th with Mubarak's resignation. February 14th, we saw the uprisings begin in Bahrain and Libya. Um, There were already protests kicking up in Oman, in Jordan, in Morocco. Uh, by the beginning of March, let's see, there were ongoing clashes between the Bahraini police and the protesters in Bahrain. Uh, We and others were trying to mediate between them to, you know, prevent further violence. And on the same day, the Syrian uprising began and the Bahrainis invited the Saudi National Guard in to forcibly put down the protests. Those two things happened simultaneously. Around the same time was was when Qaddafi made his threat about going alley to alley to kill protesters. So it it was just in the space of a very few weeks, this um, nightmarish pace of events, and we didn't know know, what was going to happen next. It all seemed it all seemed beyond our imagining. As in Egypt, 
Tunisia was a point of reference for protesters in Yemen. We begin with Ibrahim Jalal. I think when we first heard about uh, the protest in Tunisia, many of us were, were trying to think whether this coming through to Yemen, uh, mainly because uh, local developments and, and conditions were already stalemated politically. Uh, we did not have a parliamentary elections in 2009 economically. Uh, the situation was in, in decline, among other things. So the moment it spread to, to Egypt, and given that our uh, 90-62 political revolution, the Republican revolution, was in fact inspired uh, by the Egyptian revolution, it just came many years later. This one came weeks uh, after people went into Tahrir Square. And, and as a student, so my school was in Hadda, Hadda Street, and it's technically uh, away on the other end from uh, where people went in the change square close to Sana'a University. Uh, so you have all these family pressure, don't move, be, be careful about the developments. There is police repression, uh, you know, excessive levels of surveillance. And, and, and we used to have some leeways. So after school, try to go to the change square to figure out what's really happening at least to see, and you see people assembling, voicing out their concerns. And from there, things uh, went on in an escalatory term. And we've had the joint meeting parties uh, led by Islah, which is uh, the political Islamist uh, party. It politically hijacked the revolution, and that technically was a juncture on how things moved forward. It turned uh, the yeah, the Arab Spring uprising into a political crisis because revolutions often do not end with political agreements. Here's Ambassador Firestein. Hillary Clinton, uh, Secretary of State, had visited Sanaa early in, um, in January. Uh, she was just there for a day. We had a day together, uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh. That's the Yemeni dictator of course, uh, dominated uh, the visit, had a, a, a very normal conversation. She didn't really have a specific agenda. She was just uh, traveling in the region and, and uh, we had not had a senior level visitor to Sanaa for quite a long time. And so uh, she came through, we had a very good a uh, day of meetings. She met not only with Salah, but also she did one uh, what she liked to call town interviews, which was a, a kind of a mix of an interview and a town hall meeting uh, with uh, with Yemeni civil society uh, that uh, that went very well. And then uh, we had a meeting uh, later on in the day with the with the JMP, the 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 coalition group that, uh, that Ibrahim uh, mentioned. Uh, and then she left. Uh, the situation was just beginning to develop in, in Tunis uh, and elsewhere uh, in the region, uh, but there was really no indication that it was going to spread to, uh, to Yemen at that point. And so I, I left uh, to return to Washington shortly after uh, Secretary Clinton's visit uh, we were having a uh, worldwide chiefs of mission conference in Washington. I had actually gone to New York to visit friends. Uh, and while I was there, I got a phone call from the State Department saying that I should return immediately to uh, Yemen because uh, they were beginning to get indications that in fact, uh, there was um, a political developments that uh, that we needed to, to uh, be tracking. So I left the following day and got back to Sana'a about the 1st of February. And as soon as I got back, I went to see Ali Abdullah Saleh uh, to find out what was going on. And uh, there was planning underway for a large demonstration that Friday. And of course, I think typically of, of the Arab Spring uh, developments throughout the region, 
Friday was kind of the 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 day after the noon prayers, uh, where people came out on the streets and uh, and voiced their opposition. So there was planning underway for a big demonstration that Friday uh, in Sanaa. The Sala asked if I would talk to the political opposition to the JMP and ask them to help uh, put a, a, a lid on, on the demonstrations to, to stop the demonstration from happening. So I went to talk to them uh, and uh, it became clear that they were not in any mood to help Sala uh, and that in fact, uh, in the months leading up to all of this, uh, Sala had done a number of things, including uh, pushing through some amendments to the Constitution, uh, taking some other steps that made it clear that he was intent on extending the period of his rule, and also beyond that, of uh, trying to uh, position his eldest son, Ahmed, uh, as his successor. Uh, and the uh, political opposition saw that as a uh, as an abrogation of agreements, understandings that they had had with him about the way the political situation was going to move forward. And therefore they saw this rise in political demonstrations and what was going on in the region as an opportunity to basically push back on Saleh and his high handedness. So, um, so that was actually the beginning. And of course, that Friday, there was a large demonstration and the situation developed from that point on. From my perspective, what happened was that Sala, to a certain extent, of course, benefited by seeing what was going on in Egypt, seeing what was going on in Tunis. And, uh, and so Tahrir Square, of course, Tahrir Square was the was the focal point of the anti-government demonstrations in Cairo. And Tahrir, meaning liberation, has a particular meaning and a particular significance. And so Salah was determined that he was not going to allow his political opponents to occupy the Tahrir Square in Sana'a, obviously just a fraction of the size of the Cairo Tahrir Square, but nevertheless uh, important in the history of uh, of Yemen and of Sana'a. And so he um, ensured that he found some loyalists uh, uh, to, uh, to occupy Tahrir Square and to deny that space to the, uh, to the youth, to the political opponents, who then uh, took up a, a place at Tahrir Square, Change Square, uh, which uh, bordered between Sana'a University and uh, the, the encampment of the 1st Armored Division, uh, which was a military facility right in the middle of Sana'a that was controlled by Ali Abdullah Saleh's closest ally, Ali Mohsen. The notion of who controlled what space, whether physical or online, is a key theme across the Arab uprisings. Here's Rita Stefan. In the book, we have a, a whole section that talks about space and how these women utilize space, not just online space, but also physical space to symbolize their activism. What we see is the traditional uh, foras, a fora are not open to women, to minorities or to the youth. And so this is where men meet and deliberate about you know, politics and the, the you know the well-being of the of the countries as the caretakers of the countries, but where are the women? So that's one area where we see in the book, for instance, in Kuwait, in in Bahrain, they talk about that space. In many Gulf countries, where women's movement, it's not only in Gulf countries. You see that around the Middle East, where women's presence in the public sphere is not as prevalent. But this doesn't mean that they're not actors since the 1990 we've seen the uh, the internet uh, as a, an outlet for women to participate in activism and also in business now specifically for countries like Yemen and Syria where we saw 
and to some extent Egypt, we saw women um, participating in blogging and in online activism because it was safer initially. It was safer because the countries were not caught up to uh, cybersecurity. So they could, they could organize, they could uh, network, they can mobilize. We've seen that women, this is how they, they built solidarity online and they connected and they learned about you know, other movements and, and, and activism. So it is no surprise that you see in Yemen bloggers such as uh, Afrah Nasser, who was a journalist and, and started going into blogging about the situation in, in, uh, in Yemen and asking people to mobilize. During the early period of the Yemeni revolution, two public spaces, two squares took center stage. Another Tahrir or liberation square, this time in the Yemeni capital Sana'a, and Change Square. Here's Ambassador Feierstein. And, uh, and so the students, and the youth movement uh, occupied that space, a number of streets in that area. And in the meantime, every Friday, there were demonstrations, uh, for the most part peaceful, but they were large. And uh, of course, it wasn't only in Sana'a, it was also in Taz, it was also in Aden, it was other major cities and, and locations throughout the country. Uh, uh, and, but, but Sala um, managed to, to create at least the impression that there was a division in the country. So it wasn't like Tunis, it wasn't like Egypt in the sense that people um, seem to be coming down very heavily on the one side, on the side of the, of the revolution, on the side of the change. In Yemen, it was more or less evenly divided and he had, he had his loyalists at, at uh, Tahrir Square who took on the name of Baltagia, uh, Baltagia meaning thug. Um, uh, and, uh, and so he had his thugs occupying uh, Tahrir Square and every now and again, uh, they would uh, clash with the, uh, the students at uh, Tahrir Square and, and create this impression of a divided, uh, a, a divided country. Uh, I think that the, the change in, in, my, in my experience, what, what changed it was that there was an incident in March where police sharpshooters opened fire on the students who were gathered at Tahrir Square and killed about 60 of them and, and sent a number of the others uh, to the hospital. Uh, some with, with fairly serious injuries. And, uh, and so that kind of crystallized the political opposition. And the key event was that after that, so that was on a Friday. On the Sunday, two days later, Ali Mohsen, who had been Ali Abdullah Saleh's key ally, and in fact had always been assumed to be his heir, um, went on national TV and basically said that he was breaking with Ali Abdullah Saleh and that um, he was going to support the opposition. That frightened Saleh because between the two of them, the assumption was that the, that the military was loyal mostly to Ali Mohsen. Ali Mohsen was the guy who had recruited most of the leadership in the military uh, he was the one who had his, his fingers on the pulse of the military more than Ali Abdullah Saleh did. Uh, and so when Ali Mohsen went on TV and broke with him, Saleh got scared and, and thought that the military was going to turn on him and that, and that he was finished. And so he decided that he was going to step down and he organized um, uh, with Abdurrabo Mansour Hadi, his vice president, he told Hadi to lead a group with the uh, mandate to organize a succession for Saleh within one week. That Saleh said that he intended to step down within the week. And he 
brought together, it was uh, several of the GPC loyalists. The GPC, that's the General People's Congress, Ali Abdullah Saleh's Arab Nationalist Political Party. As well as several of the opposition leaders, uh, particularly, uh, uh, particularly the, uh, the Yemen Socialist Party, uh, Yassin Noman, uh, and uh, several of the people in the uh, Islam party. And then they called me uh, because they decided that they wanted an impartial observer to be in the room to listen to the negotiations. There were fairly intense discussions over the, the first couple of days of the week of trying to figure out. And, and, and the charge that Saleh gave to this group was that he would step down, but that it had to be within the context of the Yemeni constitution, uh, which um, was limited. And then about midweek, as the situation settled down and there wasn't a wholesale uh, uh, movement away from Saleh towards Ali Mohsen, that some of the loyalists went to Saleh and said, don't do this, do not step down. Um, we want you to, to hang on. And so towards the end of the week, Saleh started to backtrack and you know, kind of withdrew his offer to step down. Uh, and, uh, but but by the, at that point, in a sense, the wheels had started to move. And the wheels had started to move because Saleh had said that he was willing to go, he was willing to leave power. And then the issue became not so much, are you going to do it you know, within a week, within two weeks, whatever, it became, You've said that you were going to step down. We're now going to work out the, the terms under which you're going to do that. Thank you, Ambassador. You, in fact, started uh, where I wanted to start in, in March, uh, in mid-March, just a few days, uh, and this is quite personal to me, just a few days before uh, what we call Jum'at al-Karama, which is Dignity Friday. Uh, during which dozens of civilians died. Uh, I had my very own dad. He's a professor and a, a former minister in Salah regime. And, and that day, he resigned from the GPC alongside about 50 academicians. And, he, and I was like, Dad, are you crazy? And he was like, I mean, the legitimacy of this authority cannot be derived from the bloodshed of civilians. And that very day, he was close to the Chen Square uh, at the house of Dr. Amin al Kamali. He's, uh, he's gone now. Uh, I think the leading neuroscientist in Yemen. And, and they, they made that decision. A few days later, Ali Mehsan technically resigned. And that was, you know, the, the, the strike that turned the balance of power locally because his uh, first uh, armored brigade just sits over at Tahrir Square, and that gave uh, protesters uh, some kind of shield, so they felt secure because they had some sort of, of military backing them, around them, and with them. And, and a few days later, the resignations from the GPC continued, so that technically downplayed its, 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 its political dominance in the country. And, and that was, you know, uh, we call it al-masbaha, uh, uh, which means uh, the, the, the small components of al-masbaha started to, to spread around. And then as Ambassador Jerry explained about the backdoor negotiations with the GMP and Saleh and, and Dr. Abdul Karim al-Iryani, in early April, we heard about the Gulf Initiative, uh, the Gulf Corporation uh, council initiative, which technically was signed by the end of the year. And, and that takes me to the second point. The resistance of Ali Abdullah Saleh back then uh, was heavy. Uh, he thought dancing on the heads of snakes would continue. And to me as an observer, I didn't see Ali Abdullah Saleh, to be honest, leaving his uh, strong military rule. It was so hard to expect until the June incident happened, where there was an assassination attempt, most likely carried by 
by those who who uh, who defected from from uh, the partnership with Ali Abdullah Saleh, and he survived that very assassination in uh, the presidential palace at the mosque on Friday. So we had revolutions and, and counter revolutions, the revolutions and its protests uh, in, in Chen Square and in the 17th Square, the counter demonstration. And that very day, Saleh did pray internally, and then he was planning to go and, and cheer his supporters. Uh, it is the, the very venue where the Houthis today mobilize the, the people, rally them, and, and, and talk to them. So, and, and then I, that, was, that was like a very unexpected event to me personally as, as someone who was finishing high school then. And, and, and that very month was close to final exams. So the intensity and you have more tire shows, even the school I used to have my, 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 my final exams in were hit a couple of times. So you would see the, the, the ramifications of, of the military escalation from time to the other uh, around you. And, and then just a couple of months later in November, it was the, the, the signature of the GCC initiative. And, and between what happened in June for Ali Abdullah Saleh and, and his high ranking officials. And until then, we've seen back and forth negotiations. Uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh was trying again to, to maneuver and clinch into power, but then he reached a political deadlock. The Americans made clear that he cannot move forward, unlike when Hillary Clinton visited Yemen and made some contradictory statements because the situation back then was quite ambiguous and clear. Uh, the United States had counter tourism interests, it continued to have, and, and it had that long-term strong iron-fisted military role in Yemen, in Egypt, and a couple Arab countries. So when I was working that day in Baghdad Street uh, from the Yemen American Language Institute, and just walking and there's that big banner on top visualizing the very signature of the, of, of, of the GCC initiative in the other and, and the will of the people, uh, not all of them, at least those powerful, the political elite of the opposition uh, trimmed because many people at the street, specifically the youth felt betrayed, that they're not part of, of the power sharing, that their views uh, of of reforming the state before they demand changing the regime were just abandoned. And that was a new whole stage for Yemen and, and the broader region. Looking at things from my position as an intelligence community analyst during the revolutions, I remember the summer and fall of 2011 and the will he or won't he go discussions we kept having in the intelligence community in regard to Ali Abdullah Saleh. The negotiations that led to the Gulf Cooperation Council initiative led Saleh to step down in late 2011. But unlike in some other episodes of regime change, he would remain in the country, which had no small effect on where things would go moving forward. I wanted to understand how things looked from Ambassador Firestein and Ibrahim's perspectives. There were steps uh, leading up. Uh, I, I think I agree with Ibrahim that the assassination attempt in June was a critical juncture uh, what had happened up until that point was that uh, was that the negotiations had continued, uh, and uh, and there were a number of uh, diplomatic missions in Sanaa that got that were very much involved. Uh, the uh, the five members of the uh, the UN Security Council, the five permanent members, so U.S., U.K., France, uh, Russia, and China. Uh, uh, that group of ambassadors was very much involved in the negotiations um, and the, the effort to craft an agreement between uh, the political parties and the, uh, and the, the government. Uh, uh, the, GP, the, the GCC states came in, four of them. Uh, so the, particularly Saudi Arabia and the UAE, uh, the Omanis had an ambivalent position uh, on the negotiations, they were in the GCC group, and yet they had a, a somewhat more sympathetic position towards Ali Abdullah Saleh than uh, than the others did. Uh, the Kuwaitis were also involved, but at a distance. 
Uh, Bahrain has never been a player in Yemen. So there were the four uh, GCC states, the five you know, Security Council members, uh, and the European Union representative uh, were kind of a group of 10 ambassadors who were working very aggressively with the parties uh, to try to complete this, uh, this agreement on a way forward. Um, and uh, uh, there was a decision that was made that we, were, that we would call this the GCC initiative, frankly speaking, because there was a sense that we had that it would be more acceptable to the Yemeni people if it was seen as a, as a, as a negotiation that was led by fellow Arabs as opposed to having Washington or London, uh, you know, kind of dictating an outcome uh, for this internal affair. So, so the fact that it's the GCC initiative is a representative of, of a desire to be uh, more acceptable. But, but the GCC did play an important role. Uh, the, uh, the GCC secretariat in Riyadh was uh, very much involved. And there was an agreement that it would be signed in May and Ali Abdullah Saleh insisted that he wanted to sign the agreement on the national day. So, and we all agreed. So the night before, the night before we had actually gone around uh, because the, the opposition parties uh, refused to go to the presidential palace to sign. So the night before the national day, we went to the, uh, the individual opposition leaders and had them sign the agreement. The next day um, was National Day, we, uh, and Sala organized this big uh, demonstration at, uh, at, the, at the parade grounds by the Sala Mosque and, uh, and invited all the embassies and all of the, uh, the, uh, the other dignitaries to come to this uh, big demonstration. Salah made this big speech, uh, which was an extremely aggressive speech, uh, attacked, uh, attacked uh, the US, attacked the, the other uh, uh, diplomatic missions. And finally, at the end of the day, we got a phone call saying that the president has now agreed that he'll um, have this uh, signing ceremony. So at that point, um, Zayani and I went to the presidential palace. The others didn't go. It was just the two of us and we were supposed to have this big signing ceremony. And we walked into the big hall in, um, in, the, uh, in the presidential palace and all the TV cameras were there and all of the senior leadership of the GPC was there. And it was a huge you know, kind of show. Uh, and uh, there was a table set up and, uh, and Zayani and I were seated at the table and then individually each of the leaders of the GPC came up to sign the agreement until we got to Sala. And uh, Zayani said to Sala, you know, please, now you. And Sala said, no, I'm not going to sign. Uh, he refused uh, to sign. And, uh, <laughs> and everybody was a little bit confused because he had agreed to this, you know, he had agreed to it. Uh, but now he was refusing to sign it. So, um, uh, and, and so we, we went and we had a, a meeting with Sala in, in his office in the back. And uh, he again said that he would never sign this agreement. He rejected the agreement. And, uh, and then, um, you know, eventually we took the signed agreement. Um, fortunately, uh, Abdul Latif took it and took it back to Riyadh and, and uh, kept it back there. Um, and so that was the end of that day. That triggered uh, what became about a two week open urban warfare inside of Sana'a to the point that a, a number of the missions began to, to think that they were gonna have to close up, that this was the beginning of a civil war. And that, um, that culminated in the assassination attempt that Ibrahim talked about. Uh, he was injured uh, and eventually um, was uh, uh, medevac to Riyadh for recovery. And that kind of settled things down. Abdurrabo Mansour Hadi became the acting president while Salah was gone. And the situation uh, calmed down 
and the uh, the negotiations resumed on completing this uh, completing this uh, agreement. And that went on all through the summer into the early fall. Sala came back from his uh, medical treatment in September, and there was a big uh, kind of you know outburst, celebration, whatever. Uh, and it looked like Sala was going to refuse again to agree to the uh, to to agree to the transition until until King Abdullah at the time I think finally called Sala and told him that time was up and he needed to. Uh, he needed to uh, complete this agreement. And uh, Sala then flew to Riyadh. Uh, it was actually, it was Thanksgiving Day in 2011. Uh, Thanksgiving Day, uh, they, uh, he was forced by the Saudis uh, to go to Riyadh and sign the agreement and that started the transition. The next two years began with a lot of optimism. With the National Dialogue Conference, or NDC, providing an opportunity for Yemenis to have a say in their future. The NDC, while large and unwieldy at times, was significant because it represented the first time that all of the relevant parties and groups in Yemen were able to have a say in governance. Unfortunately, it did not meet the requirements of all of Yemen's aggrieved parties and paved the way for the civil war that continues to rage today. First of all, the, it's true that the National Dialogue Conference was one of the most inclusive avenues it was a peaceful platform that brought people to, together almost from across the political spectrum. And people went there to address accumulating grievances uh, from the past uh, decade or decades. There were issues of transitional justice, uh, women empowerment, reimagination of the social contract. And and most importantly, the willingness to give people the space to express grievances without fear. You've had the talk about the counterinsurgency campaigns uh, or what is called the Sada Wars, the six Sada Wars, which initially were held by, uh, were, were launched by the, the, the Houthis. The Houthis, at their core, are a group of Zaydi Shia Muslims from the marginalized northwest of Yemen. They had had six rounds of fighting with the Yemeni government from 2004 to 2010. And the final round in 2010 included some Saudi actions against the Houthis as well, foreshadowing what was to come in 2015. And during that very conference, the state made an apology for counterinsurgency campaigns. That was phenomenal, I think. And then you had an avenue for the Southerners to, to come and also uh, voice out their concerns. But there were huge, huge and mixed reactions. Uh, many of them, in fact, and, and that's a pattern that I observe, is that with every level of instability in Yemen, they thought that that level of instability would allow them to pursue secession. It is exactly the reason why many of them and in, in the dominant factions, in fact, to engage constructively in the NDC, they had some fear that it's dominated by the Zaydi elite, which is partly true. But at the end of the day, if you don't engage in, in, in talks and try to, to iron out these differences through peaceful instruments, uh, whenever you're having the chance in, in, in a UN monitored, internationally backed uh, national dialogue conference, then when else? And, and that's exactly why it also failed because at the same time, the Houthis were making, uh, you know, huge incursions in, in Jauf and in Amran and all the way to Sana'a in the periphery outside the center, which is very distant from negotiation holds. And the fragility of the state, the, the, the president had the establishment, uh, was weak, the military was divided, loyalties were not fully changing. It's uh, a 33 military rule. It's hard to change overnight, even in fact over years. So that played out on, on, on how things moved forward. And then you had the third issue that people often do not acknowledge. There is a, a, an unacknowledged grievance, which is the Tamakos, for example, a region I belong to. And it's been there for a century. 
from the imamate to the republicans and there has been systematic marginalization the people of the arab spring went in and 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 stage a a a, a protest in babanata and that was in 2012 and the hope was that the people in the center especially the transitional establishment would listen to them and have them included in the agenda they simply did not and that explains part of the failure is that there is no political willingness to kind of uh, open up to all grievances nationwide and it is in fact problematic because some of the quick fixes that the country has been doing over the past years are firstly based on a action than action and an initiative and second is that it acknowledges problems once they escalate and turn into uncontrollable affairs and these are the 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 core issues that continue pl- to play during the current phase of the conflict uh there is a need for decentralization and then the the final point i want to make is is and i think it is part of the problem uh power is attractive it is tempting it is appealing and the transitional establishment like uh, it's human nature it's rooted in that was tempted to continue and have an extension so many the the ndc was supposed to hold many months before it was held in 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 mid 2013 and that delay was partly linked also to the quest to have an extension in power and and all these were quick fixes that eventually attempted to to normalize changing realities uh that the international community failed to deal with credibly in line with the aspirations of of the 2011 Arab, Arab, Arab Spring uprising that initially demanded reforms uh a better living standard for all Yemenis inclusion of women and youth and the reversal of long trends Yemen was the only one of the countries affected by the Arab Spring that actually was able to negotiate a way forward before the government collapsed you can look at Ben Ali you can look at Hosni Mubarak you can look at Gaddafi certainly um you know in all of those instances you had a a, a collapse of the government and then people trying to scramble and figure out what to do. In Yemen there was a process, there was a negotiation, there was an agreed transition plan. And I think it was it was good and again as Ibrahim said, I think that the National Dialogue Conference which did attempt not only to address the issues related to Ali Abdullah Saleh and his government, but to get at some of these deep-seated grievances that were real and to try to address them in a comprehensive way and have people sit down and work together to come up with recommendations uh i think that that was profoundly important for for yemen um was it perfect no of course it was imperfect uh but it was it was pretty good the national dialogue conference finished its work in may um it, it was just beginning to uh to kind of review and roll out the recommendations 1600 recommendations put together by people who had worked pretty hard for you know a couple of years to try to do this uh but before the the ink was dry as they say um uh, the the houthis were moving into sanaa and the whole issue of the national dialogue conference recommendations was thrown out How did Yemen descend into civil war and reach the depths we see today? A regionalized conflict that has in many ways become a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran with multiple local conflicts unfolding within the larger war. To understand this question better, we also spoke to Ambassador Barbara Bodi. She was the US ambassador to Yemen from 1997 until 2001 and is now our director at the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. and distinguished professor of the practice of diplomacy at Georgetown University. The line from the end of the NDC to the Saudis coming in and regionalizing qualitatively changing the the nature of the war was not predetermined. 
um, I think it's important to remember that Yemen looked to be one of the successes out of the Arab Spring. It was a largely peaceful transfer of power. The NDC was a model on transition. Uh, Saleh was out of power without an Assad or a Gaddafi-like resistance. And so the NDC, which was an effort to basically rewrite the social and political contract, looked to be a success. The NDC made a fatal mistake in proposing a super regional structure, which was not supported by the Houthi or the Southerners or much of anybody else. They also delayed the elections and they extended Hadi's term and the country basically stalled out. Nothing was happening politically, nothing was happening economically, it just stalled. And the Houthi began uh, to push southward out of Sada by September 14, they were into Sana'a with very little resistance, including resistance from Hadi. And there was actually a national partnership plan, whether it was done with a gun to the head or not. But again, wobbly Yemeni style, maybe they're going to make it. In January, and the reasons are not clear, uh, in January, the Houthi did a pivot and they put Hadi, their own selected prime minister, under house arrest, and we saw Yemen begin to collapse. And we also watched as the Houthis not only pressed south to Aden, but east to Hodeida and into territory where they would have little to no support. There is also one other very critical event that happened at the same time. In January, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia died and he had, had taken a far more constructive approach to Yemen. His successor appointed his very young, totally inexperienced and highly ambitious son, Mohammed bin Salman to defense minister and Mohammed bin Salman, as we now know, is ruthless, capricious, and unstrategic. And with Hadi being forced first to Aden and then into exile, Mohammed bin Salman needing to prove himself to the Saudis, maybe to his father, what you had was a witch's brew that resulted in Hadi inviting the Saudis in at the end of March, 2015, there would have been a civil war and some people make the case that the civil war had actually begun. There would have been a civil war in Yemen anyway, but it would have been within Yemen and between Yemenis. The Saudi coalition, which was basically Saudi Arabian Emirates, their decision to come in with their level of sophisticated weaponry, their ability to get international support, fundamentally changed the nature, the lethality, and probably the duration of the civil war. The humanitarian catastrophe that has been Yemen for over six years now is a direct result of the Saudis, Emiratis, coming in in March, 2015, there would have been a civil war within Yemen and it would have been ghastly. There are no such things as benign civil wars. The Saudis focused on civilian targets. They knocked out Hodeida port, the major commercial port where all of Yemen's foodstuffs come in. They blockaded the port. They closed Sana'a airport. They also destroyed water treatment centers, clinics, schools, and power. And essentially 70 to 80% of the Yemeni population was landlocked without access to food, water, fuel, and medicine. 
And so, yes, no such thing as a benign civil war, but by knocking out the infrastructure um, as primary targets by the Saudi Air Force, um, they literally have starved the Yemeni people, um, have directly caused a cholera epidemic and the rest of the misery that we all know. The Houthi are not blameless. They have destroyed infrastructure as well. And the pernicious games that they play with aid agencies have not helped. But another element of the humanitarian crisis that doesn't get us enough attention is that Hadia also split the Central Bank of Yemen in 2016, which made it virtually impossible to pay the civil servants in the North or to have them work, but has also caused astronomical inflation, destroyed the purchasing power of what few wages are paid, made the cost of goods skyrocket and otherwise crippled the economy. So you have both the economy and the infrastructure having been destroyed um, with Yemeni people trapped in the middle. So where do we go from here? What steps could help take Yemen forward? I think you need to take it in small steps. And I know that there are people who argue that, that we need to get everybody around the table and work these things out. I think that, that that's an unworkable idea right now because it, if it didn't work in 2013, 2014, um, I don't see how it can work You know, six years uh, into a civil war. So I think that, that what you need to do is, is take a step-by-step -step approach. And what I would say is that the first step is obviously ending the big war. It's ending the, the, the conflict between the Houthis uh, and the Hadi government with the, with the Saudi-led coalition. Getting, you know, so that people don't have bombs dropping on their heads or shelling uh, or any of that stuff. And you get, you know, some kind of a, of a, a reasonable governance back into Sana'a that can focus on getting institutions working again, get people you know, healthcare, education, you know, basically do the basic work that needs to be done in order to have a functioning government. Uh, and you do that and allow people to, to breathe a little bit for, for a while. Focus on the economy, focus on addressing the humanitarian catastrophe, getting, you know, money into people's pockets so they can afford to go out and buy food and, and their other necessities, get people working again, uh, give them a, a kind of a life without any expectation that this is going to resolve all of the problems. The Yemen situation has only become more complex over the last six years. It's not going to be fixed easily. You've got to give it time. But, but take care of those, uh, those absolutely urgent, essential measures first. And then I would say, and it goes back to the earlier comment, I think you need to go back to the National Dialogue Conference. I think you need to go back to the Constitutional Reform Committee. Take a look at what they did. 1,600 recommendations. Some of them are probably good. Some of them probably not so good. Figure out what works and what doesn't work. And then from that point, from that starting point, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. From that starting point, then figure out what you need to do to bring in the other, you know, the other voices, the other parts of the society that can then build on what was done in the national dialogue, get to a point where you've got some kind of an agreement. And then of course, you have to go to an election because the Yemeni people have not had the opportunity to have their say in who governs them for uh, what is it now? It, we're, we're going on 15 years. Uh, since there's been any kind of a legitimate uh, negotiation, uh, you know, election process, so we got to go to that, and and let let the people then decide where they want to go from there. I agree with a lot with what what, what Ambassador Jerry said. Uh, smaller steps are needed, uh, but for me, as someone who went out and and the only day I voted uh, was on a single candidate ticket. 
Thanks to the GCC initiative. It was a great yeah. day. It was a great day. <laughs> <laughs> it was. <laughs> uh, and and for these things to happen, I think something has to change on the ground. The 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 outcome of the past six years in terms of the distribution of power is not a recipe for peace. Is not a recipe for dialogue, sustainable dialogue, that is committed. Uh, to addressing all these grievances and, and basic necessities that only heightened in importance uh, five years ago, or six in fact, the Houthis were headed to Marib. And today it is the same thing again. And I ask myself, do we need to assess the intentions and capabilities of every single actor on the ground in Yemen. And if this is the case, is the military escalation that, that intensified about six years ago is going to change in dynamic if you take out the regional uh, angle of it, which in fact made things messy, very messy. And, and with that, I go back to history into the 1960s when we had the Egyptians and the Saudis, both of them pulled out, the conflict continued until we've seen a change in the local balance of power. Once we reach there, it is the stalemate militarily. And it is in fact economically for the vast majority of the Yemeni people. Uh, the economic reality is, is harsh. The humanitarian crisis is only deepening and we are seeing trends of, of politic, politically and economically restructuring the society in and, and the northwest of Yemen. And, and, and with these changes come more questions than answers, really. Uh, so for me, as, as someone who's very committed to the democratization of Yemen, to more equitable distribution of, of resources, to, to more uh, human rights, to to going back to the basics that we had before the Arab Spring, there is much work to be done uh, both uh, politically and militarily. And I, and I don't see the political instrument as Ambassador Jerry mentioned, if it didn't work back in 2013 and 2014, it is hard to imagine going forward just with one step, let's get it sorted, Small steps need to be taken and very maturely uh, because what's coming in Yemen, if it's not tackled now, will constitute the largest threat to the proliferation of violent extremism, to the instability of, of our neighbors and, and us as, as Yemenis. Peace is needed. It needs to be done. Next time, we'll turn to Libya, another war-torn country where legacies of the Arab Spring are very much part of the present, but where hope may now be on the horizon. Thank you for listening to this series. Please leave us a rating and a review, and subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts to get future episodes direct in your podcast feed. And send any feedback to diplomacy at georgetown.edu. Funding for this podcast comes from the Carnegie Corporation of New York's Bridging the Gap initiative. Thank you to Ambassador Barbara Bodine, Hira Cambodge, Hamad Hamad, Jonas Herring, Eleanor Shiori Hughes, Andrew Hanna, and many others who have helped us put together this series. See you next time.